Hello and welcome to Gendering Geopolitics, my short series where I have quick 10 minute conversations with women around the world who are doing amazing work. My name is Emily Prey and I'm a senior analyst at the New Lines Institute in Washington, DC. Today we have a special episode with Megan Baudet, an independent researcher on Turkey, Syria and Kurdish affairs on the Turkish withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention. Thank you so much for joining me, Megan. Thank you very much, Emily, for having me on your program. So Turkey formally withdrew from the Istanbul Convention yesterday, an international treaty created to prevent gender-based violence. Unsurprisingly, there have been widespread protests uh, against this. The reason that Turkey gave was that the agreement was quote unquote being hijacked by a group of people attempting to normalize homosexuality, which is incompatible with Turkey's social and family values. So as Turkey continues to backslide on women's rights and LGBTQ issues and minority rights, how will this affect its relationship with the EU and the US, both of whom have condemned the withdrawal? Very important question. So the withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention is a textbook example of how the current brand of Turkish authoritarianism operates and how it's both destabilizing internationally and dangerous domestically from a human rights perspective. What you have in Turkey today is a government made up of two parties, the AKP, Erdogan's party, which is a conservative nationalist and Islamist party, and the MHP, uh, which is a far right ultra nationalist, um, Turkish nationalist secular party. And the common denominator of this alliance is a complete disregard for the rights of vulnerable groups in the country. That includes women, that includes ethnic and religious minorities, um, that includes uh, the LGBT community, that includes dissidents who criticize the government. And another common denominator is many ties to bad actors sort of holding the state together, whether that's organized crime domestically as the latest revelations from uh, the disgraced and exiled mafia boss Sedat Pekka have shown, whether that's ties to extremists in Syria, something we'll get to later, or increased uh, ties to other authoritarian states in the region. So what the US and the EU need to realize based on what we've seen with the withdrawal, which is you know, a violation of a unilateral withdrawal from an international agreement that Turkey was actually, I believe the first country to sign is that Turkey today is a country that's willing to take unilateral steps away from its international commitments and the rules-based order based solely on the highly ideological, anti-democratic and anti-women position that holds the state together and keeps Erdogan in power. So condemning the withdrawal, which is what the United States and the EU did, as you mentioned, was a very strong step, but governments really have to go further. The US and the EU need to see the full and interconnected picture of anti-democratic trends in Turkey, because what uh, we've seen so far with these condemnations has been very sort of separate, individualized attempts to say, no, don't do this to women, no, don't do that to protesters, no, don't do this here or that there. But when this happens, these issues are individualized and separated from this broader confluence of you know, nationalist and religious fundamentalist authoritarianism. Uh, that actually emboldens the political actors who are making these relationships that Turkey has with the West worse and limits the tools that the US and the EU can use to holistically address and stop this downward spiral in democracy and in regional behavior. So while the condemnations are good, I think that sort of paradoxically, by only condemning individual incidents and not looking at the broader trend of backsliding on and attacks on the rights of many different groups in Turkey and on basic democratic freedoms in Turkey, the US and the EU are kind of limiting themselves. And so I'd hope to see further and more coordinated action against the root causes of this authoritarianism that affects women and so many others. And can you explain how women's rights in Turkey are connected to the to the Kurdish issue? So that is a wonderful question. Um, I would argue that it is impossible to understand women's issues in Turkey without understanding the Kurdish issue, both because the most pervasive gendered discrimination that women have faced in Turkey has always been state violence and discrimination against Kurdish women and because it is Kurdish feminist politicians who are fighting the hardest to improve the status, not only of Kurdish women, but of all women in Turkey. So the Kurds are Turkey's largest ethnic minority who have, uh, since the founding of the Turkish Republic in 1923, been denied uh, their language, their culture, and their equal rights. 
Um, and in Turkey's violent efforts to displace and repress and assimilate its Kurdish population, um, sexual and gender-based violence against Kurdish women and girls has always been a tactic used by security forces in this conflict um, from the 1920s and the 1930s until today. And so both because of this and because of the discrimination that these women faced in their own patriarchal society, Kurdish women active in both armed and political struggle against the Turkish government's nationalist you know, policies of the denial of their existence developed and implemented a political philosophy and a practical program for women's representation and freedom that's really unmatched anywhere else in the region. Um, and we can get into this a bit later when we talk about Syria. But in fact, the area where the Kurdish movement's ideology um, that we see you know, in civilian parties in Turkey, in Northern Syria and elsewhere, where it diverges from that of other left-wing national liberation movements um, that are otherwise similar, is that they consider the oppression of women to be the source of all other forms of oppression and domination in society. So what this means for the civilian politics of Turkey and where it relates to the issues with the Istanbul Convention is that the strongest defenders of women's rights and political representation and freedoms in Turkey are the Kurdish women politicians of the People's Democratic Party or the HDP, which is the current iteration of a very long uh, pro-Kurdish, very long and embattled um, pro-Kurdish electoral tradition in that country. So this is true uh, in two ways. First, um, directly looking at women's issues, the HDP is unique in Turkey, the Middle East, and much of the world in that it's implemented a co-chair system for its leadership positions. It has a gender quota, so large numbers of its members of parliament and its local officials are women at a higher proportion than any other party in the country. And it has women's assemblies, which actually can overrule decisions made on gender issues by mixed gender bodies in the party. And their record in local governance, when they controlled municipalities, and I say controlled because all of the HDP elected mayors, virtually all of them, have been removed by the state and replaced with trustees and imprisoned. But when they did have that power at the municipal level, they implemented programs that studies have shown did more to address gender discrepancies, violence and discrimination than policies implemented by mayors from other parties. So these women are fighting very hard to increase uh, representation, empowerment and resources for women who are impacted by any form of violence and discrimination. But it's also these Kurdish women who've gone through an incredible amount of oppression and who are still committed to building democracy in Turkey um, are some of the strongest voices against Erdogan's, um, the AKP MHP government's authoritarian nationalist fundamentalist system. You have people like uh, Gultan Kishanak, the former mayor of Diyarbakir, who as a college student was imprisoned and tortured uh, simply for her Kurdish identity, um, who ended up becoming mayor of the city where she was a political prisoner, you know, winning a huge percentage of the vote and was jailed for that in 2016 uh, for essentially being a Kurdish woman politician who was too popular. You have uh, Shabahat Tunjal, who was a former MP, another Kurdish woman who's actually in prison on charges of insulting the president because she called Erdogan a misogynist and a racist against Kurds, which I think would be a depiction of Erdogan that we could all agree was factual. So these women are the people who are fighting back for democracy. The Turkish government is essentially terrified of them and terrified of that vision of equality that they represent. Because what the HDP is, is not just a Kurdish alternative, not just a gender equal alternative, but a democratic alternative, a pro-peace alternative, and the political future that they envision for Turkey, which is one where the Kurdish question is peacefully and democratically resolved, where minorities have rights, where women have rights, where the people of the region live together, is one that would essentially dismantle the entire authoritarian, militarist, expansionist system that Erdogan's put together. So that's why, you know, this Istanbul Convention withdrawal and the closure case against the HDP and the attempt to ban HDP politicians from politics are going on at the same time, because this is all part of an authoritarian crackdown on both women and minorities as groups, you know, as entire communities of people and against the specific politicized and organized women and men who are fighting for equal rights on the basis of gender, ethnicity, religion, and all other grounds in Turkey. So these issues are very connected. And I think that when we condemn one, we have to condemn the other, see how they're related, because it's the people who see how they're related who are doing the most to fight back. 
Um, thank you so much for giving us that comprehensive background. It really is fascinating, the governing system that the Kurds have set up. And I think that the US and the EU would do well to, to look to them as an example of how to in integrate gender equality into politics. So looking at neighboring Syria, what is the situation of the women in the areas of Syria where Turkey has effective control? It's another very important question. So when Turkey expands its military control or political control over territory, women suffer. And we know this from the demographic data that's gone out on the composition of governance in Turkish controlled regions. Um, and from reports from the United Nations Commission of Inquiry on Syria that have documented that deterioration in the status and representation of women. So in January 2018, Turkey invaded and occupied the region of Afrin, which was previously controlled by the Autonomous Administration of Northeast Syria and the Syrian Democratic Forces. And in October of 2019, they went into Ras Al Ain and Tel Abyad, also previously controlled by the Syrian Democratic Forces and the Autonomous Administration. So one study found that the local council that Turkey had set up in Afrin after becoming the occupying power there and working with um, local Syrian groups to do so included 100 members, 107 members of 100 men and only seven women. And that on the local councils in the regional smaller cities in Afrin, uh, there was no local council that included more than two women each. That's a very, very low level of representation. And that compares to in 2013, when Afrin had come under Kurdish control recently after freeing itself from the Syrian regime, women made up almost two thirds of civil society and political institutions there. And small women's neighborhood assemblies existed in every neighborhood. So in areas where there were only one or two women or no women on the Turkish backed local council, when this area was controlled by um, the autonomous administration, you'd have you know dozens of women's neighborhood assemblies at the local level. You'd have women integrated through a co-chair system and gender quotas into the mixed gender assemblies and really just an entire different system of governance. And it's more than that representation issue too. Uh, we could talk all day about the different institutions um, and all of that, but that might be a subject for a different live stream. But the other more concerning thing is that Turkish backed groups that are, you know, funded and um, supervised by, um, you know, Turkish security forces, NATO member security forces have, according to the United Nations, quote, been targeting almost every aspect of Kurdish women's lives, which has created, quote, a palpable fear of violence and duress, end quote, for the women living there. There are regular kidnappings and disappearances of women and girls. Um, there have been reports of forced marriages carried out by Turkish backed armed groups, of sexual violence, both in detention and of these victims of forced marriages, of house raids and other armed group activity. Um, there was a very notable case uh, that I think people were paying attention to last summer where in some of the rare video evidence we have, of these abuses in Turkish controlled areas of a group of women being led out of essentially a black site, an illegal prison run by the Hamza division, which is a Turkish backed um, Syrian armed group. And of course these women were later released and several of them uh, testified uh, to truly atrocious conditions um, for women, especially you know, in, in these areas. So I think that when we look at the totality of both the complete destruction of women's institutions and measures for uh, political representation, and then the regularity and scale of the violence that women in these areas are facing, we see that Turkey really destroyed something very unique for women in the region and replaced it with conditions that are essentially unlivable, that prevent many women and girls in these regions from even leaving their homes in order to be safe. So. I think when we look at the withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention in that context, um, we're essentially seeing in Syria what Erdogan's government thinks is acceptable conditions for women to live under. And I think many women in Turkey are very afraid of that. I think a lot of them are worrying if they're next. Um, and as you said earlier, there have been protests against the withdrawal from the convention. There are women across the country, you know, from all communities who are fighting back and standing up because I think that they're fully aware that their government does not see a place for you know, free, empowered and organized women 
in its current authoritarian system. They're looking at Syria, where women lost everything because of Turkish intervention and the policies of Turkish-backed groups. And they're saying this isn't going to happen to us. So I think that that Syria example is a very sobering look at, um, you know, just what Turkey feels is acceptable for women to be subjected to. Thank you so much, Megan. This has been uh, incredibly insightful and enlightening on such an important topic. Thank you. And thank you for those very insightful questions yourself.